Health Committee that I just referenced that the Senator sits on oversees the FDA, CMS, HHS, Department of Labor, Department of Education, et cetera. The Judiciary Committee has jurisdiction over the Department of Justice, among other agencies. This becomes more important when you're crafting legislation and thinking about authors and, and co-authors. But it's also important to know what a member of Congress cannot do, like intervene in local or purely state issues. So um, when thinking about how to engage in a member of Congress, it's important to know how they are influenced and the culture of the state or district they represent. This is especially true for congressional members. Is their district rural? Is it urban? Is it aging? Is it young and growing? Is it, or is, it, is the population shrinking? You can also find out what the member is passionate about and what kind of personal connections they may have to your issue. Like, for example, the senator is very passionate about mental health. This is something that um, he's been working on since he was elected. He sits in um, Senator Wellstone's seat, and he was very close to the Wellstone, so he feels not only, a, you know, he feels a moral obligation as well um, to Senator Wellstone as well to this important issue. But he also has personal connections. For example, his mother suffered from dementia, and so that's an issue that's close to his our heart. And he also is very, um, very keen and understands the issues with caregiving, um, caregiving of our aging population. So when you're thinking about how, you're, how to approach your a member of Congress, you can sometimes find out about these ways in which a member is connected to your issue. Bethany, if we can just pause mm -hmm. right there. I think that's a point we want to underscore a little bit. When you're meeting with an elected official at any level, I think it's important to ask them what they care about and maybe even why they ran for office in the first place because sometimes it is very personal reasons and that's a, a hint at what they might be passionate about. Um, Bethany just gave you some examples. Some others are um, we probably wouldn't have the Americans with Disabilities Act if Senator Tom Harkin hadn't had a deaf brother. Or uh, in the case of mental health parity, you know, Senators Wellstone and Domenici both had siblings with mental illness. So that's, mm -hmm. that's really a key point. Let me ask you another question, Bethany. Um, if we're trying to connect with a member's office, would we be meeting with the member themselves or with staff? Yeah, so that's great. Um, I'll, definitely we're going to be talking about the staff roles and how important the staff are in a couple minutes. But um, And to know that when you're meeting with staff, it does not indicate whether an issue is important to a senator or not if they send staff. It's just a matter of there's so many issues and there's so little time, and that's how staff. And so I'll talk a little bit about how to best utilize staff. Great. Um, another thing I want to talk about is understanding the member's record. So if you're going to go talk to your member of Congress or their staff, it's, you can, you know, obviously look up past votes um, and their public stances on your issue. For example, if you want to ask your member of Congress for increased funding for after-school programs, if possible, find out how they voted or if they made any public stances on after-school programs. And if they supported it, take the opportunity to thank them. This is something that people um, – is underutilized. We love being thanked. Um, you can imagine, uh, or people who answer the phones, a lot of people call to share their issues and concerns, but it's also nice just to call and thank people. And to think about this, if you do advocacy, sometimes it's easier to ask your volunteers to do a thank you call than it is to ask about um, an issue they may not know how the senator feels about. Good tip. So, yeah, when you're, you know, <clears throat> again, it's also important to understand what the job of a member of Congress is. The main job of Congress which we may forget, is to draft and pass legislation um, and to vote. To do this, they hear from all sides of an issue and must make a decision, and most of them also want to be reelected. Can we pause there again, mm -hmm. Bethany? Um, as you heard from Bethany's opening comments here, House members, there are 435 of them. Okay, so they're representing a smaller number of people mm -hmm. based on maps, uh, based on congressional district. But those two senators really represent the whole state, yes. right? Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how their, um, how their purpose might be a little bit different than a House member? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely with the House, they have a much smaller defined um, geographic area and might have a more defined constituency. 
Um, with the senators, they cover the whole state. So you can imagine with specific issues, maybe environmental or um, really any issue, they have to balance what are the needs of our folks in greater Minnesota versus our, you know, the folks in the Twin Cities. Um, and there's just a lot more stakeholders we, you know, have to engage and need to engage, um, which is why it's so important for, you know, the organizations on the phone and within the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits to be involved. Great. So now we're going to talk about the role of congressional staff, which obviously I think is really important um, because I am one. So the one thing I want to say is get to know your congressional staff. Make them your best friend. Each senator has offices around the state. And so Senator Franken has his main office in St. Paul, then he has an office in Duluth, St. Cloud, and St. Peter, and then he has folks who are home officed um, out of Wilmer, East Grand Forks, and on the Iron Range. So he has folks all over the state who are willing and want to meet with people like you. <clears throat> and then each House member has at least one office, maybe two within their congressional district, depending on how big it is geographically. And then they also have um, D.C. offices, obviously. And there are various staff who play various roles, and I get to some of those, but I'm going to focus on when it comes to policy. The member of Congress um, usually have some sort of outreach staff in a state who are their eyes and ears on the ground. They meet with folks, attend events, watch for state trends and issues on behalf of the member. And state staff um, also staff the member when they are back in the state and may also help determine what um, state activities the senator um, or member does when they're back in the state. And so my job as a state staff person is to be very in touch with my D.C. Um, colleagues. And so I work very closely with D.C. staff who handle the legislation and all the committee work. So you can easily find out who the staff person is who covers your issue just by calling. You can call the D.C. office, or sometimes it's just easier to get through to the district offices. We have less call volume. And you can just ask who covers education for the center in the state, who covers immigration, who covers health care. You can ask that, and you'll be able to get a name and phone number. Leave them a message and ask, you know, to meet with them. So, for example, I'm Senator Franken's liaison on health care. So I am attending board meetings, I'm going to events, I'm meeting with advocates, organizations, and lobbyists, I'm tracking healthcare trends and what's going on at the state capitol. Um, I'm also in constant communication with the Center's Health Policy Advisor, Hannah, and then we also have our legislative correspondent, Emily. And so we are the, we are the Center's healthcare team, uh, the three of us. Um, and so I tell her who I'm meeting with, um, what I've been hearing in the state, and then she tells me who she's meeting with, who's out meeting with, what the committee schedule is going to be, what bills they're working on. I, if I hear a bill that's going to be working on, I'll go back to stakeholders and ask them about it. And we rely heavily on stakeholder input and engagement. And while we try to reach out to a broad network of healthcare stakeholders, I just want to underscore, we don't know you exist until we know you exist. So it's really, you know, I try to do my due diligence and reach out to um, all the folks, but in, especially with social service organizations or direct service organizations, there's just so many that it's hard for us to reach out to all of them. So that's why it's so important for you to make a con connection with us so then we know we can rely on your expertise in a specific issue. And Bethany, is it ever possible that um, a member of Congress would visit our work site if you are delivering services in the community and you want them to see good work being done on the ground? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a great question. And that's something definitely why it's so important to involve your, de um, your state staff in your work. Um, you know, <clears throat> again, Senator Franken's schedule is a little challenging because he, you know, he may be in the state and never come to the Twin Cities. He may just be in, you know, southwest Minnesota visiting, um, you know, northwest Minnesota visiting the floods, southwest Minnesota visiting, you know, where they had the ice storm or um, dealing with those, the ramifications from that. And so um, I, if someone wants Al to visit an organization, I always try to go first. Like, invite me to come. I'd love to come, meet your staff, get a sense of what you do and what the visit might look like. And then I would go back to our scheduler and talk to them about what's going on with the schedule. Another challenge we have is, like, for example, with schools. They only are, schools only happen Monday through Friday and not in the summer. Al, Senator Franken is only usually in the state Saturdays and Sundays and in the summer. So those are some more challenging visits, if, you know, and some of you can attest to that. If you are only open for visits Monday through Friday, it gets a little bit more challenging from a right. scheduling perspective. And we, we do have a question, uh, not to get into too many specifics, uh -huh. but since you mentioned a couple staff members and mm -hmm. their roles, um, particularly in D.C., is there someone at Senator Franken's office who specializes in the national and community service 
um, realm, the um, Serve America Act? Um, you know, I, some issues like that touch a lot of different things, and so sometimes I interact with that due to the senior component of that. And so um, that might be something where you might just talk, I would talk to you about it. We'd figure out, I would figure out what other staff need to be involved. So that's something where you can just follow up with me directly and we can figure that out. Great. And if you want to know timelines and kind of where that bill is at, mm -hmm. um, contact Stephanie sometime after uh, 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, let's keep moving yeah. on and talk a little bit about these specific roles. Yeah. So I've already mentioned a few specific kind of staff people. So there's me, the field representative, or, you know, sometimes they're called field direct, um, outreach director. Different uh, members have different titles for us. Then there's constituent services. And I just want to say, like, in the congressional offices, most they have much smaller staff because they have smaller geographic area, smaller population. And so their constituent services representatives do dual outreach. So they might do – they're in the office doing casework, but they're also out doing outreach. Then we have our state or district directors, and those are people who manage the state offices – um, and to provide leadership and strategy in the state, the legislative assistant who's in D.C., who I talked about, who's managing the legislative work, and then the chief of staff. They're usually in D.C. in most offices, and they manage the entire staff and do and the strategy for the senator from the top. And then, oh, I also want to mention interns here. Um, interns play a very important role in our office. They answer our phones. I always say be nice. Be nice to the interns. Um, they answer the phones and do such great work for us. And so if you know young, if you work with young people, congressional internships are a phenomenal opportunity. Um, you can find more information on our website. I'm just curious, uh, Bethany, do you ever feel like that gentleman depicted in the picture there? <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds uh, like it could be overwhelming, giving the the scope of activities mm -hmm. a U.S. Senator is responsible for um, and the oh. number of constituents. Yes, I am sure that my colleagues in D.C., they were up late last night in Judiciary Committee talking about the immigration bill. I'm sure some of my colleagues feel like that this morning. I bet. Um, let me ask you one other question because this can be confusing for people. Uh, so especially in the House where the, the um, lengths, the terms of service mm -hmm. are much closer together, What's really the difference between campaign staff oh, and that's a good official question. staff? Yeah. And when, you know. That's a good question. So some people don't understand that. Um, if there's actually a very bright line rule. It's actually illegal for me to be involved in any of the senator's campaign um, anything. So, um, so there is, Senator Franken has campaign staff. And as, as you know, I'm sure most of you on the phone know, he is up for reelection in 2014. And so he's actually considered right now in cycle, is what we call it. He's actually a candidate right now. It's kind of hard to think of him that way because he doesn't have um, any opposition right now. But, um, but so he has campaign staff, and that his campaign operation will get fuller and bigger, and there'll be a lot more people. And then that also places demands on the schedule. So there'll be – so he'll have to do campaign things. You know, we have campaign events. There'll be less opportunity to what we call I'm official staff, to do official things. And so I often have people who stand with me and they're like, oh, I just want to let you know I voted for Senator Franken or, uh, you know, or I blah, blah, gave money. And I'm like, that, thank you. <laughs> but um, we represent all Minnesotans, and so that's great. But I, it, I actually I don't really care because I'm going to do the great, same amount of work I would do for you as I would do any, for anyone else. And this is probably a good time for me to just mention as a reminder, um, looking at the list of who's on the call, most of you, are probably working in 501c3 tax-exempt organizations. These are the typical charities um, who actually have an all-out prohibition against political activity. So we can lobby. That's, that's different. Um, there are some limitations on the amount of lobbying, but it's quite generous. Um, but engaging around elections is permissible as long as it's done in an absolutely nonpartisan way. So we encourage organizations to come together and host candidate forums and do voter education and voter registration and even get out the vote activities on election day. Um, 501c3 nonprofits just cannot endorse candidates or political parties. So you can't do anything to influence the outcome of an election, but certainly many nonprofits are serving people who are most often left out of the political process, low income, um, low voter turnout population. So it, it's an important niche mm -hmm. for nonprofits 
to do and actually part of meeting mission, um, but know the rules. We have separate trainings about that. You can always contact me offline as well. Definitely. And then to also follow up on that, you know, I often have folks who come into our office, you know, talking about things that Al definitely cares about and is going to support. Um, and I may say, oh, have you talked to your member of Congress? Have you talked to the other members of the delegation? And I hear, oh, that won't matter. It doesn't matter. I already know how they think. Well, I always encourage folks to do it anyway because, A, that means that that member of Congress can't say, I never heard. I ne you know, they, might, they could stand up in the House and say, I never heard from this other group. That's why I'm voting this other way. That might be completely opposite of what you would like. Um, so I always think you should always find time to talk to um, all the members. And, again, if you are, let's say, you're based in the Twin Cities and you want to go talk to Representative Klein, if you can, if you do provide services to people in his district, try to bring someone, try to bring a constituent in that can give that local perspective. Great advice. Thank you, Bethany. Yeah, so next we're going to talk about, like, how can members of Congress help you? Well, obviously, um, there are many reasons to develop a relationship with your member of Congress. Um, members of Congress, first and foremost, are supposed to write and pass legislation. Sometimes we forget that, um, since they're doing less and less of that lately. And you can be incredibly helpful to congressional office. I've touched on this already, providing expertise, local perspective, personal stories. Additionally, members may ask you to support their legislation. For example, Senator Franken is very active in the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. He just introduced um, his part of this bill yesterday. Um, and when he was first drafting this legislation, first of all, this, this bill that he drafted came from Minnesotans. They're the ones who told us about um, what they're doing in Minnesota that we thought could be nationalized. And when he was first drafting it, we continually talked with senior um, stakeholders about this issue, what was needed in Minnesota, and how he can improve the Older Americans Act. In addition, when he came up with the bill, we sought organizational endorsements. So I reached out to folks like you and said, will you lend your name or just say you support this bill? Um, now Al can say that, you know, X number, 30 Minnesota organizations support his bill when he's talking to his colleagues and he's talking to the press. Um, so also there may be issues where you need a legislative fix. I saw that perhaps Mary Jo Shipley from Store to Door was going to be joining us today. She came to our office a couple years ago and is having a specific issue that needs to be resolved by legislation. And so we are working um, on this bill to, inter, you know, amend it to the to farm bill. It's about providing, allowing seniors who are homebound who get their groceries from a grocery distributor to be able to use their SNAP benefits. And so there's something that's not allowing this to happen to the Department of Ag, and so Al is introducing a bill to help this happen because we understand how important it is for um, homebound seniors to get proper nutrition. That's a great yeah. um, specific example, and I'm guessing something like that, you would never, you wouldn't know that mm -hmm. if someone hadn't no, contacted I would have no you idea. who has the <laughs> yeah. expertise, who's yeah. on the ground. So I think that's a great example mm -hmm. of, you know, don't be hopeless. Things can yeah. change. Um, information is needed. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that story. Yeah, there's another example. So then because the senator is in D.C. most of the time, he sends out his congressional staff, he sends us out, his state staff, to do listening sessions across the state. So we've done these on multiple issues, and one of the ones I was most involved in was around the reauthorization of the Older Americans Act. He sent his staff out, I don't know how many we did, at least at least 20 across the state, just asking, how does this bill need to be improved? And we heard directly from senior advocates who said, you know, we have challenges um, reimbursing our senior, um, volunteer drivers. So for example, if you are gonna take a senior to a medical appointment, you can only get reimbursed for the time that senior's in your car. You can't get reimbursed when the senior's not in your car. So if you have to drive 20 miles to pick the senior up, take them to their appointment, drop them off, and then drive 20 miles home, that's 40 miles you're not reimbursed for. So Al is, we're actually, this is a bill we're working on right at this moment called the RIDE Act, Re Recruiting Individuals to Driver Elders Act, um, to, re to reintroduce that bill in June and build support for it. And this is something that came right from Minnesota's advocates. They said, this is something we're having challenges with. All legislation mm -hmm. starts with an idea. Yep. So what's not working? Um, how do we fix it? Another area I'm guessing <clears throat> our congressional members are protecting is, um, you know, you mentioned nationalizing things, taking mm -hmm. good ideas from Minnesota and, and spreading that. But I'm, there are areas, maybe healthcare mm -hmm. and others, where Minnesota might be doing something better yes. than even the federal government um, would allow. So how do we protect areas where Minnesota might be a leader 
Yeah, that's a great question too. We have the this is a definitely in healthcare. So, um, Minnesota has been number one in quality and healthcare outcomes for a long time. And so when it comes to things like implementing um, the Affordable Care Act here, there's a lot of states, Texas, Alabama, some other states that have a long ways to go, where we've been doing the right thing for many years. And so sometimes more federal funding might be going to these other states. And Senator Franken's job is to say, you know what, just because Minnesota's been doing the right thing doesn't mean we should lose out on this federal funding. We don't want to backslide. We, want, we don't want to go backwards. So that's something that Senator Franken is very cognizant of and then we track. Um, and obviously, there's also issues with federal regulations. You might, we hear, I hear from community clinics who might not have heard about a grant application or um, don't understand why they were, you know, didn't get a specific funding. Or um, we can call CMS and HRSA and HHS to ask, you know, can you get more information about this? Or why haven't you made a decision yet? Are you coming out with a decision soon? Just help kind of um, grease the wheels sometimes to get um, to get information back to organizations. But then we also have our constituent services team, and this is really important as well because some of the folks on, on this call deal with individuals. So we have a whole group called constituent services representatives. You might also hear them called caseworkers, and they work with individuals, um, individual constituents who are having trouble navigating federal agencies. So for example, veterans benefits is a big one. People who are troubling, having trouble accessing their federal um, VA benefits. We have a caseworker who has a direct line to the VA who can submit cases, who asks for more information, what's going on. Another big one is immigration, green cards, passports, connecting to embassies. Um, maybe there's, this happens more often than you might think that there's a tragic accident that happened overseas to your loved one and you're just trying to get more information. We can contact the embassy and try to get that information for you. Um, so. If you, uh, housing is another one. So if you are having, if you know of individuals who are chubby, having trouble accessing federal agencies, you can contact any of your congressional members and they can help you work on that. Um, and again, federal funding is another thing that many nonprofits are very interested in. Um, if you have, um, if you want to access federal funding or you are applying for federal funding, you can ask your member of Congress for a letter of support. Um, and we are happy to do that. And that's handled out of our state office. Now, different congressional offices do it differently. This is another reason why it's so important to have a relationship with state staff. They can tell you, oh, I do that, or they do. They can just help you navigate the process. But I just want to make a caveat. Members of Congress cannot weigh in on private funding decisions. So, for example, they can't write a letter to, you know, a foundation or to a state agency um, asking for, for to make a funding decision. Um, so I guess I just want to underscore how important state staff can be. There's also like with scheduling, inviting a member of Congress to your um, organization. I can't, you know, I can't tell you how many times something gets mailed to DC, it takes them a while to get through it, and then I get the invite a week after it happened. Like, and it, there's nothing I can do then. So it's just, you know, it is important to know if you have an event going on in Minnesota, send it to, get to know that state staff or send it right to the state staff. If you want to invite the member of Congress somewhere, they can tell you who their Minnesota, like we have a Minnesota scheduler. And then I always say, CC me. If I don't know you invited out something, I can't fight for it or I can't make a pitch for it. I, I oftentimes those decisions are made and I didn't even know that it happened. I'm like, ah, oh, why didn't they, why didn't they just CC me or tell me they're inviting the senator somewhere? So. And I know from looking at the websites, all the contact information mm -hmm. for every district office, state mm -hmm. office is on the website, correct? Yes. Yep. We have a question, Bethany. Um, actually, we have a couple. Let me ask you one first about, you yeah. mentioned the listening sessions that are yeah. held around the state mm -hmm. to hear directly from constituents. What if you have a specific issue area? Is it possible you might appeal to staff to host a listening session on your topic? Oh, well, I mean, those? to do a, a full out, like, you know, 20, 20 visit, you know, statewide listening session, probably couldn't pitch that. but. You, I mean, we love it. I love it when organizations host a congressional briefing, invite me and the other congressional staffers to it, just to tell us, just do it once a year. Up, uh, update us on who you are, who you're serving, what your federal connection is, if you have a federal legislative agenda. We love that. Um, and so I, you know, and I've helped organizations do this. Um, I've helped ho host them at my office. Um, so that's something to, that you 
you should definitely do. And that sounds like a great option for a coalition. An individual mm-hmm. organization, you know, uh, probably would want to look to their colleagues in similar fields to have kind of a critical mass of people who are working on the issue. Um, someone else has a question about um, administrative remedies. And if you can think of an example, I mean, I think most people understand how legislation works mm-hmm. at the state or even federal level, uh, but what would be an example of a way a member's office could kind of assist and navigate mm-hmm. um, with the executive branch? Yeah. Well, I'll give you a really high, high profile one that just happened recently. Um, so some folks on the phone who may be involved in, you know, health care and um, what would happen at the state level, one of the things that was kind of iffy about what was going to happen to the Minnesota care population, we had Medicaid expansion, we had the healthcare marketplace now known as Minsure, but what's going to happen with these folks between, you know, 139 and 200% of the federal poverty line? Um, And so there was a provision in the Affordable Care Act called the Basic Health Plan, but the um, Obama administration was just so underwater that they weren't writing the rules. They weren't coming out with the regulations. So the state of Minnesota didn't know how do we account for these people we want to. This is another area. We don't want to go backwards. Many states don't have something like Minnesota Care, so it wasn't pertinent to them. But there were a few key states who did. They're like, well, the, the one thing we don't want is for the Minsure to be implemented, and this group doesn't get insurance or gets worse insurance, you know, whatever it is. We don't want to go backwards. This is another yeah. example of that. And so they brought it to our attention. Advocates brought it to our attention. We worked really closely with um, Governor Dayton's staff. And Senator Franken, we, you know, we called CMS multiple times um, at staff. It got elevated. Senator Franken called um, called CMS multiple times, and then he eventually had the opportunity to talk to the president about it and said, "This is important to Minnesotans." And um, they said they're going to come out with the, you know, the regulations in 2015, which allowed the state legislature to draft their legislation and fund it, and that just got passed. I don't know if it was over the weekend or last week or this week. Yeah. Um, and so that all happened because people brought it to our attention. We worked closely with Governor Dayton's um, administration and the Obama administration. It's also a great example of how state governments need to work with the federal government mm-hmm. on implementation. Um, and I think I've heard the phrase that 30 cents out of every dollar that comes to Minnesota originates in yeah, Washington, yeah, D.C. Yeah. So it's both policy and money. Uh, before we move on to the next slide, I'll just point out there, most of you probably recognize that's Representative Betty McCollum featured there. If you don't recognize her, the name kind of gives it away, I guess. But um, she's another example of someone MCN has worked closely with. A few years back, she sponsored a bill that would have created uh, kind of something akin to the Small Business Administration that exists for for-profit smaller organizations. And she was looking at doing something that would create um, both some technical assistance as well as collecting data and research on the nonprofit sector because no one federal agency does that, right? We are regulated by our tax exempt status, so a lot of things fall to the IRS, um, but certainly nonprofits are working sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly through pass through um, with many. Uh, federal agencies. So that's something we'll continue to pursue along the way as well. Um, So now that you know a little bit about all the prep work you should do, um, so now now what do you do? First, you call your local office and you ask who in the state office works on your policy issue. Again, you leave them a message or send them an email asking them to meet. You can also go to Washington, D.C. to meet with the staff or the member. Um, I just want to underscore that you don't have to go to Washington, D.C. There's other ways to get in front of um, the member and the staff. But some folks like to do this. It's, it's challenging when you're a uh, senator to have individual meetings in the state. Like I said, he may never even step foot in an office when he's here in Minnesota because he's just he's traveling around visiting um, areas that are undergoing, you know, um, natural disasters or, you know, doing site visits or um, what have you. So individual meetings are not as common in the state. However, he takes many individual meetings in D.C. There he's in either one of, you know, he's in his, you know, he's in one or two buildings in Washington, D.C. And so it's much easier from a scheduling perspective and just the kind of the nature of the workout in D.C. But even if you can't get to D.C., you can meet with um, 
you can meet with state steps. So, for example, I meet with people often and invite my D.C. colleagues to listen in on the phone. So you're essentially having a meeting with the D.C. staff without the D.C. staff being there. And then we can sort out amongst us who's going to do what kind of follow-up and what needs to be done. Um, you can also, obviously, we talked about inviting the member of Congress to visit your org. Again, it's best to know the state staff and develop a relationship to help you facilitate this. Um, and also, many constituents contact our office via the phone and letters. So I thought, you know, I couldn't go without talking about this. So obviously, when there's wide-scale advocacy campaigns, or when people read stuff in the newspaper and want to call and tell us their perspective, they do that. They can call the D.C. office or the Minnesota office, and they send letters. Um, we tally all these calls. We get a report every week that says who called on what. Was it opposition or was it support? And so we can see what the hot topics are. I actually often just walk by the intern bay and I'm like, hey, what are people calling about today? Just to get a sense of what, what's on people's minds. So don't discount those phone calls. That's not the best way to call and um, like to create a relationship with a staff. Um, but as an, so as an organization, it's best to you know, um, touch base with staff and develop that relationship. That is an important point, though, and I hear that from state legislators as well. Um, sadly, a lot of people don't weigh in on issues, even though we live in a well-established democracy and that's kind of what we rely on. But I've had legislators say if they get three calls, five calls, you know, a handwritten letter on mm -hmm. a topic, it matters. Mm -hmm. And what you heard from Bethany there is people are paying attention, they're recording all that, and that's also cover Mm -hmm. for the member mm -hmm. uh, when they vote a certain way is they want to be able to cite that data. This is what I'm hearing mm -hmm. from folks back home. Um, so always encourage your constituents to weigh in. Um, I think it's also good, too, to, if you can, uh, many of us work in fields where there's a national association or you know national level coalition on your issues, and many of them host a day on the hill um, to draw attention to the issue and, and uh, even set up meetings with members. So I encourage you to try and make one of those sometime. Yeah, and I think it, when you bring up national organizations, that's another thing that's interesting too. Like oftentimes we get um, issues from, you know, Minnesota and Minnesotans bring issues to us. So then we want to draft legislation, but we need to get national state, buy, you know, we need to get the national orgs buy-in because this is not just going to be Al Franken. It's not going to be able to pass something on his own. So sometimes we rely on Minnesota orgs to call their national orgs and say, this is important to Minnesota. Senator Franken has taken a position. He's willing to lead on it. We need to stand behind them. So that's another kind of um, dynamic that state staff can be help state organizations can be helpful with. Um, so last, just so, so you're meeting with you're meeting with the member. You're meeting with um, staff. Here are just some tips. Obviously, we talk about being an expert on your issue. Be credible. Um, um, keep have local stats or info on hand to demonstrate how important your issue is to the member's constituents. Um, this is particularly, you know, we love to have state level data. Members of Congress love to have congressional data, which I know is sometimes a little ch challenging to get. Have a personal story to share. And if possible, have them in written format. Um, why I say that is because, I mean, we hear all great stories, personal stories, but then I mean, am I supposed to be right to jotting that down? You know, A, we have to get a release maybe if we want to use it. I may not remember the, all the great points of the story. So it's great if you can have that in a written format and send it to me electronically afterwards so we can um, keep it. And then address the opposition. Like, we're going to ask, so who is against this? Who are now, you know, we want to be prepared. And you guys usually know better than us who may be against something. Um, and be able to address what their concerns are and always make the ask. I can't tell you how many meetings I'm in where they're just giving me information and then they leave. I'm like, do they want something? And, you know, I may sometimes be like, well, did you want something? But sometimes I won't because sometimes if you can't do something on it, I'm not going to offer, a, you know, I want to offer solutions. So always make the ask and give us something concrete we can do. And then um, follow up. So we may ask a lot of questions during our meeting and, um, need additional information, and so we need you to, you know, get that for us. So please follow up and provide additional information. And congressional staff can get really busy. We are caught up in the um, saga of the day often, and so we may forget that we said we're going to do something. Just ping me, shoot me an email a few weeks later and say, hey, have you followed up on this or what's going on with this? And it's oftentimes we have to contact HRSA, and we haven't heard back from HRSA yet, and we've, we didn't realize we hadn't heard. And then we just call HRSA. You know, usually it's that kind of thing where we're just waiting for information for you, but we need to be reminded to follow up. And then last, just, you know, be respectful. 
you know, understand our time constraints that we have, we're juggling a lot of things and how long it may take how long it may take us to address your issue. So if we do have to contact CMS or HHS, that can take a while. We have no control over how long they take to get back to us. Um, and oh, um, then also just like thank again, if let's say we do introduce a bill that you ask us to or co-sponsored it, tell your members, put it in newsletters, thank us, send Senator Franken a thank you note that thanks him for his leadership on it. It just makes us more, you know, determined and, um, you know, want to get out there and really try to do what we can. We love being thanked, if I haven't said that enough. <laughs> he, and, he, and here's, I think you just demonstrated a reason we need you. Um, just in that answer, I heard you talk about HRSA, CMS, oh, yeah. and HHS. <laughs> yeah. So why don't you translate yeah. uh, for those of us who might not work in those specific yeah. areas. Yeah, so those are common terms to folks in healthcare. So it's Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. That's Health and Human Services, which actually oversees CMS, and then HRSA is the Health Resource Service Administration, I, I think, something like that. Yeah. Um, so a lot of folks who work in healthcare interact with those agencies a lot. And so that's another thing is we use a lot of acronyms. And another thing, so when you're meeting with the member, um, I just cover healthcare. And even within healthcare, I know an inch about a mile wide of issues. So I'm often sitting on the other side of a table dealing with experts. You mo more often know more than me about the issue that you're talking about. So um, while you can use usually use acronyms with me, that's great, but some of when you're meeting the member, they may not be always up to date on what the acronyms mean, specifically in your little niche area. So Senator Frank is really good. He usually say, oh, can you tell me what that means? But some members may just let you keep talking. Um, so it's really good to be clear about acronyms. So I should take my own advice. <laughs> well, and here, here's the beauty of these kind of partnerships. I agree with Bethany. Our organizations on the ground have the expertise mm -hmm. to offer solutions. Bethany's got the expertise on how things get done here in Minnesota mm -hmm. and also with her colleagues in Washington, D.C. So working in partnership together, that's pretty powerful. Um, and I think anyone who's ever visited Capitol Hill or been in Washington, D.C., knows that the Beltway is a bubble. And I think um, one thing that's really helpful in her tips is these personal stories uh, can remind members that these decisions affect real people. And that's, I think, part of our meeting mission as nonprofit organizations. I just want to bring up one other thing that I forgot to mention. Another thing is, Sometimes you're just going to have to agree to disagree. There's going to be times when you're meeting with a member and their staff, and you're just not going to see eye to eye on that issue. And it's always good to still tell them. You can even say, like, I know this is something that we don't agree on, but I still want to let you know why it's important to me and the people we serve and important to Minnesotans and the people you serve. But also try to find common solutions. Maybe you are not going to agree on this issue, but maybe there's other issues that the member works on that you can work on together. That's something that I see a lot with organizations. They sometimes have a lot of tunnel vision. They have their legislative agenda. They're focused on these four things. When I bring up, hey, the senator, you know, I'm not sure where we can come to agreement or consensus or what we can do about these four issues, but there's this other issue that affects the people you work with that center is really um, works really hard in or is really interested in, sometimes you have to kind of broaden your perspective and say, okay, that's not our legislative agenda, but yeah, we can help you work on that, or we'll lend our support, or we'll lend our endorsement. It's not our number one top, you know, issue, but in order to build that trust and relationship with the staff, sometimes you need to kind of broaden um, your perspective. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a good source, Bethany, maybe online, um, like like the those federal agencies we just talked about, HRSA, mm -hmm. CMS, HHS. Uh, is, is there a guide to you know who the federal agencies mm -hmm. are, or maybe committees of jurisdiction, even a list? Mm, probably, I'd have to yeah. look into that. I can try to find that. Get back. Okay, we'll try and follow up with people. We've got all your emails um, if you're signed up, so we'll we'll try and provide some lists or maps um, mm -hmm. of that. So I think we're at the point where we just want to open it up for last questions. We've got a few minutes left. Um, I'll take this opportunity, too, to do a little commercial for something else new we're doing this year at the Council of Nonprofits is hosting a Coffee with Congress 
series. And in fact, Senator Franken kicked off the very first one uh, early on in the year. So we've um, held forums for nonprofit and philanthropic audience. The series is hosted by both the Council of Nonprofits and the Minnesota Council on Foundations. Um, watch our website. We've already heard from a number of members, but as we get into the summer here, there'll be um, more chances to meet face-to-face -face with a member of Congress. And we would encourage you to come to any or all of them, not just your, uh, you know, who you might be a constituent of if your organization is located in their district, but, but to come to any of them and get some of these issues on their radar. So I'm not seeing other additional questions. We have some requests that we'll try and follow up with you on. Let's go ahead and we'll give you a, a minute or two there to jot down this contact information. And remember, we don't want to put everything on Bethany because there are 10 members here. We've got eight members of Congress and our two senators. And they have very good websites. You just Google them, you'll, you'll find them. And the Minnesota offices, the DC office contacts are always listed. Um, certainly if you have something specific to Senator Franken or something you heard Bethany say that you want to follow up on, shoot her an email. It's all there. Um, I'd also encourage you to continue to look for our other webinars that are advertised throughout um, the rest of the year and watch for that next Coffee with Congress. Bethany, any closing thoughts? No, I just want to again encourage um, organizations to get involved in um, the legislative process. If you do have some sort of federal connect, I encourage you to connect with your um, federal offices. Um, there are people like me, as I say, just sitting around waiting for your call. Well, not you know. <laughs> we, we want to meet with folks like you. It is our job. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Bethany personally and publicly for taking time out of her busy schedule to talk with us today. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for the work that you do to make Minnesota a better place.